So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's Digging In with TPS MTSU. We are really excited to have you join us for the last webinar uh, for us for 2022. Um, so um, as per usual, let's do a couple of quick housekeeping things before we jump into our topic for this month. Um, as always, for those of you who are participating with us live, uh, be sure to keep your mics muted. Uh, make sure we have your first and last name visible. And again, we always love to make our webinars as interactive as possible. So uh, feel free to use that chat function uh, throughout the session. We will be responding to that. Uh, now, the topic for today, because we're going to be doing some songs, um, I will note for those of you who are going to be watching the recording, uh, we will be pausing the recording uh, when we play the songs because of copyright issues, but we will reference how you can find the links for those. Um, so that is uh, one of those fun things we get to navigate today. So just know that, um, again, if you didn't get to participate live, you can still access those uh, through the links that will be mentioned. But for those of you who are with us today, um, we're going to listen to some fun music. Um, so. And some not quite as fun music. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and remember, of course, that we have our Padlet page um, so that you can find, again, the links to some of the things that we're going to be referencing today. Um, and again, an easy way to access everything in one place for this series. So with that said, I'm going to turn things over to my partner in crime on this, uh, Stacy. So Stacy, take it away. OK, thank you, Kira. I just put the link to the Padlet in the chat box for those of you who are with us on the Zoom call right now. I am going to just do a quick intro to this month's issue. So I'm going to share my screen. So you should all be looking at the issue. I'm going to make it a little larger here. So um, we've done music themed issues before, uh, but we haven't really kind of looked at specific songs as teaching tools. And I'm sure that a lot of you already do this because it's a really great way to engage students. And there's so many songs about history. When I was first trying to come up with some ideas, I did some Google searches and there's just tons of stuff out there, but you know, some meet curriculum standards better than others and some are more appropriate for uh, students than others. Um, but in this blurb on page one, uh, we link to a bunch of additional ideas uh, in case you're interested. So I kind of talk about these in two ways. One is the songs themselves being primary sources for the time period in which they were written, like the Star Spangled Banner, which is linked there to a lesson plan about this that uh, Suzanne Costner, who's with us today, actually created that's on our website. Uh, John Brown's Body, of course, is a really great primary source for the period right before the Civil War, um, talking about slavery and the abolitionist movement. Strange Fruit, which uh, Billie Holiday made famous, a song about lynching. It's not an easy listen, but it's a beautiful, haunting song. And there's a really great essay uh, at the Library of Congress that this is linked to. And then a really great blog entry at the Library of Congress on the song, We Shall Overcome, which of course is one of the most famous uh, uplifting songs in American history from the civil rights movement. And then of course there are songs that modern day artists have created about things in the past. And so the links in the second paragraph here are to just to YouTube videos uh, that you can play. So Buffalo Soldier it, is a really great one by Bob Marley, it's very catchy. But it's a great way to talk about the African-American experience during uh, Reconstruction and the Western movement. Um, the night they drove old Dixie down, I'm a, I like the band, so I had to put that one in, but you know, multiple perspectives on the Civil War, maybe um, Don McLean's American Pie and Johnny Cash singing about the assassination of President Garfield. Um, and then of course, uh, many of you are already familiar with too Late to Apologize and Bad Romance, uh, which were put out by Suomo Publishing. Uh, really great parody songs with wonderful videos that are just perfect for fitting into your units on either American Revolution or women's suffrage. And I know when I was in eighth grade, my social studies teacher played We Didn't Start the Fire. And uh, I know there's a lot of teaching resources available on the web for how to use that song. And so I just linked to one example of that here. Um, 
So I, I just want to go through kind of quickly what else is in this month's issue. We have a featured feature on an exhibition that we've actually linked to in several um, previous issues and lesson ideas and lesson plans. Um, the Library of Congress celebrates the Songs of America, which is really a kind of a where the Library of Congress takes songs that are scattered throughout their other collections and brings them together, thousands of them, and puts a really fantastic contextual essays with them talking about genres, uh, song biographies, musician biographies, um, how to teach different eras in American history and what how music and songs actually contribute to that in um, social, economic, political, cultural ways. So uh, this is just a really great resource for any era that you're teaching in American history. Unfortunately, they don't really have a, a lot of world history tie-in on this one. Uh, Kira is going to talk about a Loretta Lynn song. Um, Abby Highcade, our graduate research assistant, is going to talk about the Battle of New Orleans. I'm going to talk about uh, the murder of Edgar Evers in just a moment. But I did want to draw your attention to page four, where we have four additional songs, of course. Shenandoah, uh, I know it's one of my favorite uh, folk songs. Um, the Library of Congress has a write-up about that and some great recordings that you can listen to. There's a whole bunch of World War I songs. Uh, you can bring in sheet music and talk about uh, propaganda music. Um, there is a whole webcast on the influence of ABBA. So if you're a fan, uh, then you should take some time to watch that one. And then of course, uh, Fortunate Son by Credence Clearwater Revivals. Um, it's a fantastic one when you're teaching the Vietnam War. But I am going to uh, walk you through just very quickly um, a Bob Dylan song. I am a big Bob Dylan fan. And Bob Dylan, of course, uh, is well known for his lyrics, which are very poetic. And um, in fact, you know, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature because his lyrics are so rich and meaningful. Um, not really a, a catchy song, so I'm not actually going to play this recording, but a very important song nonetheless. He actually sang it at the 1963 March on Washington. Um, but uh, Bob Dylan uh, wrote a song about the murder of Medgar Evers. He was a, um, Medgar Evers was a very important uh, early civil rights activist in Mississippi. He was the first NAACP field secretary and he helped organize uh, youth groups, uh, voter uh, registration, boycotts and all sorts of different things. And he actually tried to enroll in law school himself, but was denied because of his race. And so he tried to help James Meredith after that, who did become the first black man to enroll in a law school in Mississippi. Um, but Mecker Evers was assassinated in 1963. So this is five years before Martin Luther King was assassinated um, in front of his own house in the back as he was coming home and his wife and children were in the house and they heard the shot ring out and they kind of figured out what happened uh, before they even saw because he lived under death threats uh, quite frequently. And so um, all these links will take you to different resources. Um, his house is actually a national historic site. So this link will take you to the National Parks Services page on that property. And um, so he was killed in 1963. The killer went on trial uh, twice and both times there was a hung jury. They were deadlocked. They couldn't come up with a verdict. So the killer actually walked free. Uh, and it was only through the efforts of his wife uh, who kept trying to get a new trial that 30 years later in 1994, the killer was retried and then finally found guilty and uh, died in prison uh, after serving about seven years of his sentence. But uh, so the name of this song is only a pawn in their game, which is gonna be significant as you'll see it come up later. Now, 
Uh, the first link is to a national public radio article about this song where you have a historian talking about what Dylan means by these lyrics. But this video, which I'm actually not gonna play, I'm just gonna click on so you can see a few seconds of it. That way we aren't gonna violate copyright. But this is uh, Bob Dylan's actual performance of the song at the March on Washington. So you can see the people milling about, you can see the Jefferson Monument, you can see all the people standing in front of the reflective pool around the Washington Monument, and then you can hear Bob Dylan singing this song um, starting at like the 10 or 11 second mark. So he just starts playing. All right, and he starts off by saying, uh, you know, talking about the bullet that killed Medgar Evers. So what you want to do is have your students listen to this song and read the lyrics. So I'm going to bring the lyrics up on the screen and we're going to take some time to go through these together. So uh, I am going to read them out loud uh, since we're not listening to the song itself, um, but it won't take very long. So a bullet from the back of a bush took Medgar Evers' blood. A finger fired the trigger to his name. A handle hit out in the dark. A hand set the spark. Two eyes took the aim behind a man's brain. But he can't be blamed. He's only a pawn in their game. A South politician preaches to the poor white man. You got more than the blacks, don't complain. You're better than them. You've been born with white skin, they explain and the Negro's name is used, it is plain, for the politician's gain as he rises to fame and the poor white remains on the caboose of the train, but it ain't him to blame, he's only a pawn in their game. The deputy sheriffs, the soldiers, the governors get paid and the marshals and cops get the same, but the poor white's man's used in the hands of them all like a tool He's taught in his school from the start by the rule that the laws are with him to protect his white skin, to keep up his hate so he never thinks straight about the shape that he's in, but it ain't him to blame. He's only a pawn in their game. Um, I'm going to skip one of these just to get to the last one. Today, Medgar Evers was buried from the bullet he caught. They lowered him down as a king. But when the shadowy sun sets on the one that fired the gun, you'll see by his grave on the stone that remains, carved next to his name, his epitaph plain only a pawn in their game. So um, the man who shot him was named Byron de la Beckwith. And he was a member of the KKK. He was a member of the White Citizens Council. He, like Megger Evers, was a World War II veteran. Um, and because of his service, Megger Evers actually was buried uh, in Arlington Cemetery. He has a military tombstone. Uh, but uh, so this is describing Byron Della Beckwith in a certain way that, you know, a lot of people, this song has been very controversial. Uh, and so a lot of people did not like it as a civil rights song. And so I'm wondering if you can put in the chat box uh, what who you think the pawn is and what you think the game is that are referred to in the title of the song. Any ideas? So uh, a couple of different things. Uh, someone mentions that really the pawn can be either uh, Medgar Evers or uh, Byron de Beckwith. Uh, the pawn could be referring to Beckwith, you know, being the one kind of the hand doing the dirty work. Um, uh, someone else mentions that they've actually never heard this song. So this is all, all new to them. 
Well, Bob Dylan wrote so many songs. It's, uh, I'm sure you've heard one of his other ones. This is from the album, The Times They Are a Changin', which of course is his most well-known anthem from the civil rights period. Um, okay, well, so the, uh, the NPR article that's linked to a, in the second paragraph uh, is the way they interpret it is that, yeah, Byron Della Beckwith is a pawn of all these different institutions and groups representing white supremacy. And he's the one doing the dirty work as you put it. Um, and so then uh, in the lesson idea, there's a primary source from an oral history interview with Dory and Joyce Ladner, who were young activists in Mississippi who worked with Medgar Evers. And they did this joint interview, their sisters. And, um, so there's a very long oral history interview transcript and I took three pages out of it and highlighted the parts that you can have your students read. So with those lyrics in mind and the questions about who's the pawn, I'm going to show you this three page excerpt from this oral history transcript. And I'm just gonna um, go through it real fast. So Dory's saying that she went to the trials and at first she had to kick some white men's feet because they put their feet on the bench and wouldn't let me sit down. So she kicked their feet and then they let her sit down because she had a temper. Um, and then uh, Barnett came in and Barnett, uh, the, at the second trial, Barnett was the governor of Mississippi who came in and uh, we'll get to that in a second. So the sheriff and uh, so the mistrial happened so quickly, we didn't know, um, okay, and then she's talking about, uh, there was some mob violence there waiting for her. So she remembers seeing Ross Barnett, the Mississippi governor, walk into the trial of Medgar's killers and he went over and shook his hand. He shook the hand of Byron Della Beckwith at the trial for the murder of Medgar Evers by Byron Della Beckwith, the governor of the state did that. Uh, he was indistinguishable from the other Klan supporters sitting there. And I said, my God, there's so-and-so. Another time Dory and I decided we were going to go to his inauguration. So every time when Byron Della Beckwith would come in, the Klan would stand up and give him a standing ovation. Yeah, they did. It was awful. And applaud and applaud. And he would bow. Yeah. I mean, he was like some famous rock star. And the district attorney, so the person who is supposedly prosecuting Byron Della Beckworth, uh, in choosing the jury said Medgar Evers was a N-word. And this is me deleting that out. Uh, the Library of Congress has the word in because their transcript is what exactly what the women are saying. Um, but he lived over in N-word town. I don't agree with what he did and I know you don't either, but it's my job to uphold the law. And so this, district attorney using this word and choosing these jury members actually became another governor of Mississippi later. Do you think it's wrong for a white man to kill an N-word? And that's the way the jury was selected. That was the district attorney. And so um, I know we don't have a lot of time to go over. That's quite a lot to unpack there. But uh, how does that actually fit with the idea that Byron Della Beckwith is a pawn in this larger game from the eyewitness testimony of these civil rights activists? So it is really, other... yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, it's really striking that you can see again, the, the links to which, you know, different uh, entities are going there to uphold the system of segregation um, and, and the racial hierarchy in the state of Mississippi. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 was, it was supported and it was coddled almost. It was, it was definitely applauded at every level, even the people who were supposed to be prosecuting the killer. And the jury, of course, they, um, they didn't say he was not guilty, but they didn't say he was guilty. They were deadlocked both times and he walked free for an extra 30 years. So this is not one of those feel good songs uh, this is not an uplifting one to play in the classroom, but the song goes very well with some of these primary sources and Medgar Evers, um, he was an incredibly important figure who would have had an even bigger um, career in civil rights if he had not been assassinated so early. 
So I am going to turn it over now to Kira and I will be back. Um, actually, we're going to turn things over to um, Abby Highcate, who, again, as Stacy mentioned, is our uh, graduate assistant uh, currently with the uh, with our Teaching with Primary Sources program. And uh, because of her class schedule, this is actually the first time she's had a chance to join us for one of the Digging In um, sessions this semester. So, um, Abby, uh, why don't you share with us your lesson idea for the Battle of New Orleans? Thank you, Ms. Kira. Just let me share my screen here. Hopefully it'll work out. This is it. Can you see this? Okay. Oh, wait a second. I forgot to share the sound. There it is. Okay. Now I can share it. All right. So let me get this going. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Abby, as Kira and Dr. Graham have introduced me as, and I will be doing my, I'll be explaining my lesson idea for the Battle of New Orleans, and this song is by Johnny Horton, and it was um, performed and published in uh, 1959. So we'll get started here. So I believe what set one would be for this lesson is to have some prior knowledge of the Battle of New Orleans. And this could vary between teachers. You can decide if how much prior knowledge to, um, your students will need before um, doing this lesson activities. Totally up to you. These are just a few main points I put on there as examples. So is a very... Battle of New Orleans is a very significant um, clash between American and British armies. It took place in 1915 during the War of 1812. It's also significant because technically this battle happened after the War of 1812 ended when uh, the Treaty of Ghent was signed in 1814. So that's pretty big. The, and it's even bigger that it was an American victory and made Jack um, Andrew Jackson, the national hero, which led to his election as president in, um, in 1828. And I only put this little point here, Jackson known as Old Hickory to his men, because when we get to our lyrics of our song, it's going to mention Old Hickory, Old Hickory. So to make that connection, that, that is also Andrew Jackson. So um, I am providing two images for this lesson activity because what, when we look over our worksheet, it mentions illustrations and how you vi visualize what the lyrics are um, describing. So our first one here is a primary source from the Library of Congress. And if you look here, it is a um, it gives you a visual of the Battle of New Orleans right at its climax. And I just want you guys to take a moment, look at this image, and tell me in the chat, like, what do you see? What do you notice? What do you think is going on? So on and so forth. So I'm just going to give you a moment. So it's mentioned that it looks like the U.S. has the high ground. Um, the first thing that jumps out to me are, is the uh, the number of uh, soldiers that we see in red uniforms. That seems to be kind of almost the dominant color um, that we see um, in the image. I agree. So, yeah, so this is like an image. You see all these red coats here, the British Army, and you notice how many of them are. You also notice how they are actually up front in the image, while the Americans you can see them in the background here. So you see the American flag here. This is kind of, you can see how this is the British point of view of the battle. Yes, I agree with all that. Someone else mentioned, of course, that the smoke that we see there is hiding um, some of the battle scenes. So we can't really see everything because of how the smoke is obscuring yeah. some of the, uh, the fighting. Yeah, cannons played a really big role in this battle, especially in the... Um, benefits of the American army. They had the high ground. And so when they fired the cannons, it was a straight shot into the British army. So that gave them the upper hand. 
Yes. And we'll go to our second image here. If, there it goes. So our second image here is actually a secondary source. It was um, made much later after 1815. And so it's kind of considered more of a secondary source rather than a primary source, but it's still from the Library of Congress. And I particularly like this image because of how um, all the colors and how um, Pona is where you can see the Americans and then the British. So again, I just want you guys to look at this for a moment. Tell me in the chat what you think about what is being depicted here. What are some other details that you notice? So the first thing that's mentioned uh, right off, uh, as soon as you pulled up the image, of course, is that we see the folks in their buckskin suits um, there in the front uh, with fighting, uh, you know, with the, the uniformed uh, U.S. soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those buckskin um, clothes are actually going to come up in our video I'm about to show you. So there's that connection there. I like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing, this one image is almost a reverse in perspective where the other one we saw the, uh, you know, the British soldiers were kind of front and center. Um, this is almost as if you were taking it from the opposite perspective uh, of being able to see from, I mean, from the high ground down to the low ground instead of the low ground up. I agree. Yes. And that's a good compare and contrast that you can use in the classroom. Uh, and then, of course, we see the the river, Mississippi River, and ships there in the background. Yes, those are are the British ships. Like, it is pretty well known in the world that the British the British Army have one of the greatest navies like in the world. And so, just having those ships there was probably very intimidating, especially since Jackson only had like a few hundred men on his side, where there was eight thousand British soldiers on the other. So. Yes. So moving on, there's very good observations here. And the, again, like these two images compare and contrast to each other very well. And they serve as a visual before listening to an audio source. So you have that visual and now we're going to our audio source. And before that, I'm gonna show you guys um, the lyrics of the Battle of New Orleans. So. This was written um, by a man named Jimmy um, Driftwood. He's actually a teacher and he wrote this, um, was a teacher. He was a teacher and he wrote this song for his students to teach about the Battle of New Orleans. And then Johnny Horton came and he recorded it and it became like very famous and is still very popular today in um, 1959. So I'm not going to read the lyrics because there's a lot here, but I did recommend for this is um, verse one, three, and four, and of course the chorus. Two kind of just gives a little bit more details on the um, on the men and on the American side, but one, three, and four um, here, and then in verse three you see Old Hickory. I mentioned before that Old Hickory is also um, Andrew Jackson, the same person, so making that little distinction there. Um, just take some time to read over these lyrics and then we'll um, read, we'll not read, we'll watch the video of Johnny Horton performing this song. I like to mention to um, this is not just the only song about the Battle of New Orleans. You know, it happened in 1815, and this was public, and this was recorded in um, 1959. In between the time, there were dozens of poems and songs that were inspired by this battle because it was so significant to America's history. So I just wanted to put that little side note in there. And if you can find other like those other poems and songs to use in your classroom, I think that would be a really good idea. I didn't do it particularly for this lesson idea, but I still think it would be a good idea if you decide to do this. Does anyone have any comments they would like to make about these lyrics before we go to the video?
so one thing I noticed uh, there in verse three, it mentions we opened up our squirrel guns. And so again, uh, that struck out to me as, you know, we're not talking about professional military. We're talking about, you know, just regular mm -hmm. folks who hunt for a living. <laughs> yep, they did. So, and like, it's probably those men who were wearing buckskin um, clothes too. Yes, volunteers to fight for um, the American army. Okay, let's go to our video here. I have on the side here um, some questions and some other notes that students can think about while they're watching this video. So how does Johnny Horton portray this battle while he's singing it? There's, there's some funny little um, miming going on in the background while he's singing. And then you can have them observe the costumes these actors are wearing, the setting they're in, and then the action as well. And then, Kira, if you like to stop the recording. So what did you guys? So what did you guys think? <laughs> My favorite part is when they suddenly go all West Side Story and start kind of dance fighting. <laughs> I love that all of this action is happening behind the the singer and he's he's just singing a song like mm -hmm. there's a battle happening behind him. Uh sometimes mentioned they actually show this clip to their students uh and, and how much the students enjoy uh, watching this one. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's mostly because of how upbeat it is, you know. It's not it's kind of got like a some comedy to it and it also tells you the story like with some fun uh care to race to like the bridge and I mean you can see like you know the buckskins and costumes and stuff so I really like this video a lot mm -hmm. any like those here yeah. all right so after you show this oh you got some Spartans break time so after you show the video, after you give lyrics out to the students, um, we have this worksheet on the Teaching for Primary Sources website called the Thinking About Songs of Historical Artifacts. You're looking at this here, this is what it looks like. And I'm just going to briefly go over what it um, pertains. So you have looking at the song, you have responding to the song. The responding to the song are the student's personal opinions, personal reactions in each box here. Is what they think of it, what were their, um, and what do they think of the emotions were produced here. Up top, you have like a physical format. That's where the images I showed you earlier, they can use that, or they could possibly use the video to um, illustrate what they thought. And then the lyrics, what people, places, and events were mentioned, um, and what do they notice? Was it catchy? I mean, it's, I think it's pretty catchy. Is it fast, slow, dull, upbeat, serious, et cetera? And down below, um, teachers, you may have to give a little bit more information for this bottom section, such as like, why do you think the artist wrote the song? Um, what clues do you suggest um, to find to suggest this? Maybe the song doesn't really give the answer directly but you could help your students out and then like what for what audience the song was written in um why is it important and then finally what does the song tell you about what life was like during this period in history um this could be taken both ways so like this is more of an upbeat version of the battle of new orleans but that could also tell you that this is, was an American victory so there's nothing really to be sad about because it is an American victory so so just some ideas and then I think this is a really good worksheet that you can use for any song about history any song at all are there any comments people would like to make about this worksheet uh, we actually had someone who mentioned that uh, they wish that they knew that this worksheet was around uh, previously. So yeah, yeah. Well, it was a really good tool to use. Well, here it is on the Teaching with Primary Sources website. Oh, that's not that's not the right button, Abby. Why do I go back? <laughs> It's hiding my tab and I can't get back to my tab. 
There he goes. All right. So this next clip, we're not going to watch it because we don't have enough time to, but it's just like an optional second clip. It's still Johnny Horton singing Battle of New Orleans, but it's in a different setting. It's in a different costume, as you can see. There's your squirrel gun right here. And it gives just like, it's just a different setting and different, but same song, still Johnny Horton. And then you can compare and contrast both videos if you like. It's just optional if you have time to. We're not going to play it. <laughs> and then here's my final thoughts. So like I said before, this song was originally written for students and to teach them about the Battle of New Orleans. I think it's pretty significant. Um, but it could also um, give it like, an opportunity for a fun activity to give to give students to write their own songs about, about a historical event, like any historical event you would think it would be really cool to write a song about. Um, and then at my bottom here, I think it's just a really upbeat tune that gives a lesson a more lively mood rather than a more serious tone. Like, not that there's anything wrong with that, but yeah, it's my, that's what I got. All right. Well, thank you, Abby. Uh, and yeah, I think this is kind of a, a fun way to teach, um, the battle of new Orleans, which again, is always looking for kind of fun hooks to get, um, kids interested in, uh, topics that they may not think that they're interested in it. Um, so I am going to be, uh, hold on, let me make sure that I've got the correct thing here pulled up, uh, talking to you guys about uh, Loretta Lynn's song, um, The Peel. Um, so this song, um, I know I had never heard of this song prior to a few years ago, and I was listening to uh, a podcast series called um, Cocaine and Rhinestones, which is uh, covers all these different kind of country music uh, kind of stories. And there was an episode about this song and why it was banned. And I was like, oh, there was a Loretta Lynn song that was banned. Like, I want to know more about this. Um, so again, that was my first introduction um, to this song. So when we come up with the idea to do this newsletter, I immediately thought that this one would be a good one because another thing that has been referenced to us recently is, you know, folks are looking for materials and ideas to cover things that have happened, you know, really, you know, in the more modern um, age um, of American history. And so I thought, you know, this song is one that's really interesting because you really can do a couple different things with it. Um, you can uh, teach about uh, you know, the women's rights movement, uh, especially as related to reproductive health um, in the 60s and 70s and forward um, using this song. Um, or you can use it to really kind of teach a, a broader um, history of, uh, of, those, of those issues. Um, so for the lesson idea that you'll find in the newsletter, um, I focus primarily on um, kind of the earlier um, history of this. So thinking about kind of what happened with the early birth control movement, Margaret Singer, who we're going to get into in a minute that you'll see picture here. Um, but I did want to bring up just a couple of things for context to help us to kind of understand the song and understand a few things that'll be needed in order to kind of get more out of the sources that we're going to look at. So you'll, students will need to understand uh, just some kind of some background knowledge. One thing that's gonna be really important is for them to understand about the Comstock laws. Um, so these were passed in the late 1800s. Um, they're really pushed through and um, advocated for by a man named Anthony Comstock. And they outlawed any printed materials with information about sexual health, uh, especially materials being sent through the US Postal Service. Uh, and of course, this was a big emphasis on making sure there was no information shared about contraception. So again, those are passed in the late 18, 1800s. And the Comstock laws are going to be really important, again, really throughout the 20th century. We get into the 60s and 70s, uh, and you'll see some laws and some things brought up that'll be kind of in reference uh, to the Comstock laws. Uh, of course, Margaret Sanger is going to be really important, and we'll get to her in just a moment. But when we think about the history of the pill itself, uh, again, kind of research for that starts in the 50s. Um, there is FDA approval for uh, a contraception pill in 1960. Uh, within two years, over a million women uh, are actually already using the pill. 
Uh, and then we get to 1965, we get to uh, the Griswold versus Connecticut Supreme Court decision, which is really important. Um, there, the Supreme Court rules that the government cannot prohibit married couples from using birth control. Uh, again, this is in reference uh, to some different laws that were passed in other places. Uh, and, and also it references some other portions of the Comstock laws, uh, but it does allow for uh, it to still be illegal for single women to um, have access to birth control pills in 26 states due to the Comstock laws. Uh, by 1970, though, Congress removes references to contraception from federal anti-obscenity laws, again, Comstock laws, uh, and by 1973, of course, is the year of the Roe versus Wade decision. Uh, and then 1975 is when we have this song released by Loretta Lynn. Um, if you're not familiar with the song, we are going to listen to it here shortly. But uh, the song is about a married woman um, who is uh, you know, excited to be able to have access to the pill because um, she doesn't want to have any more children. And she wants to be able to have uh, essentially the same freedoms as her husband at that point. She's tired of being pregnant all the time. Um, so again, we will we will listen to that in just a moment, uh, but wanted to first kind of get into some you know, ideas about how you could take this song to teach again that longer arc of uh, the uh, the birth control movement. So to do that, of course, Margaret Sanger is going to be really important. And within the uh, the lesson idea itself, you'll find a couple of different links, one to uh, a really thorough timeline that you can use. It's from PBS. Um, so definitely take a look at that. Another one is there's a really interesting article from the National Women's History Museum about Margaret Sanger. So again, if you need some background information on her, who she was, that's a really good uh, contextual source that you can use with students to give some background. Um, so, uh, so definitely take a look at those. So for uh, this, you know, I've linked to a couple different analysis sheets. The one that I think works really well with this activity is actually our economic, social, and political analysis sheet. Because as you're looking at the, the text sources that we're going to look at in just a moment, as you're listening to the song, I mean, really all of this gets into, again, thinking about how these issues and the things that they're talking about have economic, social, and political influences during the time. Uh, and so uh, I, I would recommend using that particular analysis source. Of course, you could use the basic one as well. So within the lesson idea, you'll see that there are references. Uh, oh, one other thing too, before you get into Margaret Sanger, uh, it's probably going to be important that your students have a little bit of context for the eugenics movement because she can be a controversial figure to teach. Um, usually because people kind of tie her up into the eugenics movement. And so it's going to be important that students have some context for understanding, again, that early eugenics movement um, in the U.S. Um, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and one of the passages we're going to look in here will kind of, again, you'll get some hints as to why that's important. Um, so you can find a number of different um, newspaper articles that were published um, that are available by, from the Library of Congress through Chronic in America. And they actually have this um, topics um, listing here where you can find a number of these that are again pre-selected for you. And again, you'll see there's a bunch that you can choose from. We're going to look at two. Um, but again, you could look at any of these. You also see they give you some really good suggested search terms if you want to do some additional searching and find um, other articles related um, to her. So let's see. So the first article we're going to look at is from March 13th, 1915, and this is from the Daybook. Um, this particular article um, I picked out because this gets into talking about uh, one of the times that she's arrested essentially for violating the Comstock laws for publishing some of the pamphlets that she published. Um, and so um, in this article, it talks about, actually on the previous page, let me go back for just a second. Um, so it talks about, you know, that there were 100,000 copies in circulation of one of the pamphlets that shows leaflet family limitations. Uh, and so again, this article talks about how like, you know, no other newspapers are really talking about her because they'll get in trouble because of, again, the Comstock laws uh, and suppression of information that she's been trying to share. Um, but, you know, she has 100,000 of these circulating. And again, that Margaret Sanger is making the argument that it's really important, especially for poor women to have this information because, um, she feels like that people who are, are you know, wealthier already have the information. 
Um, but because of the way the laws are applied, um, that you know, poor women are not having the same access to information about uh, about you know how to prevent pregnancy. Um, so you know, and she again she makes this point that there's this double standard of law in the country: one law for the rich and another for the poor. Um, so I thought that was an interesting piece in this, uh, again, for kind of how she's advocating for her work. Um, but what I found really interesting about this particular article is, again, where it talks about um, the fact that she had previously been arrested, again, for circulating these, uh, you know, these pamphlets uh, about birth control uh, because they violated the anti-obscenity laws. Um, so when she's released, she goes to England so she can continue her work. Uh, but uh, Anthony Comstock and others who were very opposed to the work that she was doing basically then target her husband, William. Um, and so they send someone to their home uh, and this person pretends to be a friend of Margaret's uh, and asks for a copy of one of the pamphlets. Um, but, you know, the husband says that he doesn't think there are any available. Um, and the friend says, no, no, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that you have one, at least one laying around here. And he kind of keeps persisting again, saying he's a friend of Margaret's. Uh, and so the husband was like, well, let me go look at her desk. Um, does find one. The friend leaves, comes back later that night with Anthony Comstock in a search warrant, uh, and later arrest William that night for violation, um, again, of the anti-obscenity laws. Um, so they try to get William, um, as you'll see here towards the bottom of this article, um, to basically take a plea. Um, he refuses to do so. And again, where I find this article really interesting. So he is preparing to fight for his constitutional rights for free speech. Um, and, you know, and again, it's going to take this to court. And then, uh, then it mentions here at the very bottom that, of course, the whole point of this was that, unfortunately, Comstock's reviews his work that Margaret Sanger has written to say that she is unwilling to have her husband be sent to prison in her place and that she is going to return to New York to stand by his side as he goes to trial. Um, so again, what I thought was interesting again to the students with, again, you know, this um, this argument about, you know, you know, the First Amendment and free speech and how that plays into the birth control movement at the time. Um, I also think that you could also do some interesting parallels between, again, um, the political uh, fight that she is having uh, compared with the political fight that maybe some of the women's suffrage, especially the more militant ones of the National Women's Party, um, that they were having, again, right around the same time period. Um, so I, you know, I think that's kind of an interesting comparison that you could bring up. So the next article, and this one is from the same publication, the Daybook, published a year later. Um, and this one, again, is a little longer. This is uh, some comments, uh, kind of a synopsis of some comments that Margaret Singer was making, again, about why uh, you know, it's important, um, actually, you can see here, uh, you know, why it's important, and then officials are just going to have to accept the birth control, again, is going to be a thing, um, so that they're going to have to change these laws, and I really found this particular passage um, very interesting, where she says, within two years, every man and woman in this country will know how many children they can afford to have, um, and when they know that, I predict that two generations of birth control will wipe out all of the slums, eliminate the birth of mental defectives, minimize the number of humans in our insane asylum, and automatically put a stop to child labor and prostitution. And I say it will wipe out child labor because statistics show that 97% of our child labor is recruited from families that are too large to be cared for by the parents. So again, this is that one where especially this passage right here, um, you, it's why it's important to understand some about the uh, eugenics movement, because um, definitely some of this language very much mirrors some of the language of the eugenics movement at the time. But what really stood out to me is how this passage really harkens back to some some images that I think of when we think about progressive era. We think about the Jacob Reese images. We think about the images of, you know, the fight against child labor. We think about issues of slums and tenement houses. Um, we think about public health issues with tuberculosis. Um, and again, all of this is, again, really kind of hearkening to the, these same issues. And so here Sanger is making the argument that if we just, uh, especially poorer women and working families had access to birth control, we could eliminate some of these social issues. Um, so again, this is where that ESP, I think, can be particularly um, effective to, again, kind of connect some of these things that students will already be familiar with, with um, some of the context of this particular passage. So that is two that you can uh, look at. 
There is another that I uh, referenced, which is this one right here, which is Women, Morality, and Birth Control. Um, again, this is a pamphlet that Sanger wrote herself uh, and published. Um, there's, uh, I'm not going to really have time to read through uh, any of the, the uh, excerpts from this, but there's a portion at the very first of it um, that I think is really interesting to have students look at uh, because she really talks about in uh, the opening for this pamphlet why it's important, uh, again, for women to have access to birth control. And again, she talks about it as, a, you know, women cannot be free until they can essentially have the freedom to control their own bodies. Um, and that that will help put them onto equal footing with men. Uh, and so that, again, kind of hard to why is, you know, again, why is she advocating for these things? And then she goes in again, talking about um, some of the challenges that she had seen, especially poor families experiencing um, at her time working as a nurse in New York. Um, so again, tenement houses, all those things that we think about with the progressive era, uh, you know, she shares these stories and again, why she feels that this work is so important. Uh, and so again, um, that uh, pamphlet is one that you could definitely pull out some excerpts from and use with students. So, yeah, if you, you know, depending on which of these that you wanted to use with your kids, um, you know, you could then draw some comparisons. Again, okay, so this is all happening in the 19 teens. Um, and again, then we have, again, the advent of the pill. Uh, again, within a couple years, we have over a million women that are using this by 1975. Um, Loretta Lynn uh, publishes uh, or produces this song. So I'm going to pause the recording. Um, and for those of you who aren't watching live, again, you can access this um, through the link in the newsletter lesson ideas. Um, so let me get to where I can pause the recording and then we're going to take a listen to this song. So again, uh, I guess I'm going to mention there's a lot of uh, chicken uh, references in the lyrics to that song. Uh, but again, after listening to having kids listen to the song, uh, your students, um, you know, have them do some comparison. You know, what are some of the messages that we hear Loretta Lynn talking about in that song? And how does that compare to some of the things that we see referenced, you know, in Sanger's writings, again, from the 19 teens? Uh, and so, again, I think that you could draw some comparisons and, again, think about, you know, where do we see some, some similarities there? Um, so hopefully that guy give you some, you know, some suggestions, some ideas that might be helpful. For thinking about how you can do this. Uh, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you're interested um, in uh, learning more about kind of the history of the song, uh, I've again included a link to this particular um, podcast on uh, this song and why it was banned from country radio. Um, so uh, it was a pretty interesting listen. So I would definitely uh, encourage that. So with that, let me switch real quick to some of our resources. I know we are about out of time. Um, so they're on uh, page two of the newsletter. Uh, again, as Stacy mentioned earlier, definitely check out Songs of America. We do have a couple of other lesson plans. Uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, one of our older ones is Barbara Allen, The Evolution of Folk Songs. Um, if you've not had a chance to check this one out, this is a really good one for, again, thinking about how folk music changes over the times. Um, then uh, we have this land is your land, the power of folk songs. If you are interested in this one, uh, I'll link to, we actually have a, a webinar that we did, maybe that was last year, I believe, um, that really kind of digs into this, uh, this one. Yeah. yeah, I think it was in January. Yeah. Of this so, year, um, if uh, yeah, almost so, a year ago. Yeah. So yeah, there's a whole uh, separate thing that you could, you know, if you're interested in kind of more background information on um, on this one, again, we had the lesson plan, but we'll also share the link to the other webinar. And then of course, we also had the songs of the labor movement. This is another uh, particularly um, good lesson plan that brings in songs, both labor movement and civil rights songs and kind of how the, the music between those two movements um, actually uh, kind of does some overlap. We have uh, a newsletter that we did on Tennessee music a few years back. There's a lot of great links in there. Of course, there's a, you know, a lesson idea on Dolly Parton because what newsletter about Tennessee music would not be complete without something about Dolly. Uh, so there's a really great primary source set that the library has on Civil War music. So if you teach in Civil War, that's um, a good, uh, good source to look at. Uh, there's another one that the library has on music and U.S. reform history. Um, so that's one to take. If you're looking for music, uh, especially historic music that you can bring in, the National Jukebox Collection has tons of great stuff. 
Um, also, uh, you know, we like to feature some of the different museums um, in the state. There's a link to the Birthplace of Country Music Museum um, that's up in uh, Bristol. We did a workshop there a number of years ago, and they have some good educational resources on their website. And then the final thing that we linked in here, um, I found a site, and I can't remember the organization that put this together, but they have a number of really interesting lesson plans. Um, but the site is called The Music That Shaped America. So again, um, if you're looking for some other resources, I found some really cool stuff um, as I was kind of perusing through that particular um, website. So hopefully today we've given you some uh, some different resources, some different ideas that will be helpful for you kind of going forward. Remember that you can find, um, you know, all of the links to different things uh, referenced on our Padlet page, um, either using this link or the QR code there. And for those of you um, interested in receiving Q, uh, P, uh, PD credit um, for either today, you know, participating in today's session, or if you're watching this recording, um, fill out the Google survey um, that you'll see linked here. Um, or of course, you can use that QR code to access the survey. We generate these um, about once a week. So once you've completed the survey, it can take up to about a week to receive your certificate via email. Um, if it takes longer than that, definitely feel free to drop me an email and let me know, and we'll be happy to get that sent out to you. Um, again, thank you guys so much for participating and joining us today. Uh, we will not be doing a Digging In webinar in January. We will take a break in January, but we'll return on the second Thursday of February, and our topic then is going to be the 1970s. Um, so uh, again, sticking with uh, how we've ended today with kind of more of a modern America take. So we're going to look at the 70s uh, for that month. Uh, we also have um, coming up in, uh, I believe in February, you can find the date on our website. We will be doing a workshop at Fort Negley in Nashville. So if you're interested in coming out and joining us for an in-person workshop, we will be doing uh, one um, at Fort Negley. Um, in early 2023, and we'll be in Chattanooga later in the spring, so definitely be on the lookout for information about that date as well. Thank you guys again so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Thanks.